This program contains scenes that have been dramatized, with special attention given to historical accuracy. He looks like a high roller, but he's not. Richard walked into my office and announced, I'm Richard Marcus, I'm the greatest living American past poster. He's a cheater. He and his crew are among the best ever. He took over the casino. It was a beautiful thing. His career spans decades. His scores run into the millions. All he has to do is stay one step ahead of the man who has sworn to catch him. I wanted them so bad, it became a game. It's like cat and mouse. This is the true story of Richard Marcus, the casino chief who thought he could invent the ultimate con. <laughs> we made people dance the way we wanted. We took control of casino personnel like puppets. To be a successful casino cheat, you have to play by the rules. Three in particular. First, build a team you can trust. Can't do that with a chip. Uh, I don't know what I was thinking, I'm sorry. Here, you take those. In fact, you know what, here, take this too. Thank you. A little too much of the juice, you know what I mean? Miss you, have a good night. Good luck. Second, Never let the heat get to you. There's no way that's a legitimate bet. Richard Marcus. Yes! Yes! Third. Yes! Make sure yes. your move is the best in town. Baby, yes, that's five Jimmy. Jimmy. Those are nickels. See for yourself. Did you catch the move? All right. Five cheese, Brian. Invincible. Hold on, tape back. Maybe. There's nothing there. Nineteen seventy-six, a big year for America. It's the bicentennial. Viking One lands on the surface of Mars, and Steve Jobs introduces the Apple computer. But Las Vegas is the same old place. In these gaudy, glittering days, Las Vegas is still the streetwalker of American cities, a garish, glamorous city of schemes and skin. And now, on this summer night in nineteen seventy-six. Richard Marcus has a bag full of cash and the confidence of a high roller. Never had any uh, aspirations to become a casino cheater. It just happened because of gambling. I won a lot of money in betting trifectas at, at, uh, at the racetrack. That's the money that I took out to Las Vegas. A New Jersey native from a middle-class family, Marcus has been a hustler since grade school. Now, He's ready to start his career in the Vegas big time. That was maybe twenty or $30,000, and uh, I was a lucky, happy-go-lucky kid. Gambling in Las Vegas, I ran that up to about $100,000, and in one or two nights, lost it all. Las Vegas, city of suckers, city of losers. Three days after arriving, Richard Marcus is living on the street. Sleeping underneath the uh, overpass with a bunch of winos, I might have been uh, completely finished with casinos at that point because I was really down, down and out. Broke and desperate, Marcus talks his way into a low-paying casino job on the graveyard shift. And there, during a long, slow night of dealing cards, he is approached by a mysterious stranger. Sometimes in life, you can just trust somebody without knowing them, even though that's rare. So, Joe, it's Joe, right? Joe Klassen. So you said you'd been, uh, watching me? That's right, Richard, all week. And I noticed you never cheat or steal. Never. Everyone else in that rat hole pinches a dollar chip, a nickel here. But not you. 
Why is that? Naturally, I, I asked myself, you know, well, what's this guy want with me? I relied on my instinct, and just something just kept telling me that, you know, this guy's for real. Maybe I've just been waiting for the right opportunity. It's an enormous gamble, but Richard decides to trust this mysterious mentor. Richard fixes the deck at the casino where he works, and together the men scam more than $20,000. And at that point in time is when Joe started to teach me about what him and his partners were doing in the casinos, and that's really when my career uh, began. Deal me a hand of blackjack. What Joe and his partners are doing in the casinos is known in gambling circles as past posting. You bust, pay me. Hey, what are you doing? You paid me 15. I bet a thousand five. Stick with me, and that little trick will make you a rich man, my friend. Past posting is a scam as old as gambling itself. It's the cheetah's version of the sure thing. Placing or increasing your bet after you've already won. It takes its name from horse racing. By 1890, there were over 200 tracks in the U.S. And over the years, every new technology, from binoculars to the telegraph to radio, has been used to learn the results of a race and get a bet down on the winner after the horses have passed the post. Like other forms of casino cheating, past posting relies on teamwork. The commander's job is to read the scene for heat from casino security. A combination of attention and agitation, which cheaters call steam. Like a baseline coach in baseball, the commander gives the go-ahead signal to the pivotal player, the mechanic. The mechanic is solely responsible for switching the chips at a precise moment with as much rapidity and as much accuracy as possible. The mechanic makes a small initial bet. For example, three red $5 chips in a stack for a bet of $15. If he loses, the mechanic lets the dealer take his chips. But if he wins, the mechanic must respond with split-second timing and the dexterity of a world-class magician. 34, red, even. As soon as the dealer paid, he would go out with one hand, with his left hand, pull out the $15 he originally bet, then slide in two $500 chips with a $5 chip on top, and then the $15 that he pulled out would disappear in his pocket. Watch closely. In less than a second, the mechanic has boosted the bet from $15 to 1005 Unbelievable. Easily the best cheating move ever. The product of years of cheating, the culmination of an entire career. And the best part about it, it's simple. So simple, it's practically idiotic. With the switch made, the mechanic actually steps away from the table, and the third cheater instantly steps in. This player is the claimer. It's his job to collect on the phony bet. Nobody ever touches a dealer in a, in, a, in a casino. Dealers do not get touched. So just a little tippy touch on a finger is the equivalent of getting hit in the head by a hammer. Hey, hey, you paid me wrong. The claimer has begun his psychological attack on the dealer. Every dealer is trained to case or scan the table before each roll or spin and take a mental snapshot of the bets laid out on the felt. The claimer does everything he can to challenge that snapshot. That's why he takes the mechanic's place, suddenly confronting the dealer with a new face. And that's why the claimer casually moves his hand to reveal a hidden pile of big money chips in his own rack. Say $5,000 on the table. So the first thing the dealer says to himself is, what would a guy with $5,000 sitting on the table be doing betting only $15? And finally, all that uh, in, in conjunction with the tap on the finger, all that that just assaults the dealer and makes him believe that he made a mistake. At first glance, casino pass posting seems so clumsy and obvious that it couldn't possibly work. But it does. Remember, a dealer is not taught to look for bad moves, 
They're just taught to deal the game. The average dealer on the table, if a move is pulled, most of them would not know a move. After weeks of intensive drills, Joe tells Richard he's ready for his first real-world move. Even though I had faith in everything he told me, uh, you know, it's still, you don't believe an airplane can really fly until you get in it. And uh, I, I, I'm not a big drinker, but that night I took three stiff ones. 26, black. In fact, I was so nervous that I almost killed the dealer, the poor dealer. I mean, I attacked him. Hey, hey, what are you trying to pull? Hey, hey. Uh, Joe told me to just go out and touch his hand softly and say, hey, you paid me wrong. I went out and grabbed his wrist. You got thousands out here on the table. You paying me with fives? Sorry, sir. And they, they paid me so fast. It was like they were, they were afraid. To the casinos, past posting is stealing, plain and simple. Every floor man, every pit boss, is charged with the task of busting cheaters like Marcus and putting them in prison. But that doesn't scare Richard Marcus. He has a new dream. He's going to be the best casino cheater in history. And Richard really took the crime like a duck to water. And if I were to ask the average person to, to complete this phrase, if you give a thief enough rope, you'd probably say he'd hang himself. And I'd say if you give a thief enough rope, he's going to tie you up and beat the crap out of you and steal all your stuff. The biggest weapon casinos can muster against thieves is the security apparatus. But the all-seeing video surveillance now common in casinos is a recent innovation. In the 1960s, catching cheats was left to security men who actually stood above the casino floors on catwalks, watching through binoculars. But the biggest deterrent to professional cheating is what happened when you got caught. The mob was still a strong presence in Vegas, and cheats were routinely backroomed, taken off the floor, threatened, roughed up, and sometimes worse. In the 1970s, more and more cameras were popping out of casino ceilings, but a talented cheater like Richard Marcus knew there was only so much they could see. On a good weekend, thirty, forty thousand dollars They got away with it constantly. Uh, an average weekend, 15, 20. And they made a lot of money. I looked at it as an art. It was like playing a violin. I mean, there's all kinds of great examples of where they send people out and uh, scout out dealers. We made people dance the way we wanted. And they've got list after list, page after page, of what dealer weaknesses, good or bad. We took control uh, of casino personnel. And what shift, what's their hours, what's their break time. Like puppets. Just to be able to know that I can work or not work. But success can breed carelessness, as Marcus finds out in a downtown casino. Mr. Marcus? He's grabbed up by security, doing a passed post on the roulette wheel. And then these, these lackeys from the uh, gaming control board are trying to scare me. You know, if you don't tell us this, you know, you're going to be in prison for 10 years. We got you on tape. Listen, my friend, you're in a whole lot of trouble. We caught you past posted. Joe had warned me about it, told me, schooled me, uh, never say anything. Don't lie. Don't say anything. What they have, they have. What you say cannot change anything. We're going to take your mug shots. We're going to wake the judge up. And he walked in for the first time, and he had these icy blue eyes, and uh, right away, I, I felt his presence. The new arrival is a specialist, a field agent for Griffin Investigations, which specializes in catching casino cheaters. The agent's name, Andy Anderson. There was something about his demeanor, or something about him, I didn't like. Andy Anderson was looking at me with his cold eyes. You could almost read in this kid. He was young then. He was only in his 20s. You could feel he knew he knew more than we did. I could sense that he, he's a, he could become a formidable opposition. Joe's advice is correct. The casino tries to break down Richard's story but they don't have any taped evidence. In the end, they let him go. 
But from that moment on, Richard has a new adversary. A man as fanatical about catching cheaters as Richard is about past posting. Vegas is now a danger zone. Chased out of Las Vegas by the implacable casino detective Andy Anderson, Richard Marcus and his past posting crew have to find other pastures to practice their casino cheating art. We went to Europe uh, a few times and we were using thousand dollar chips. Atlantic City was already though at the tail of its big explosion there. We must have split up in between two or three million, four or five years in a row. They actually studied the game, they studied the people, they studied their moves. And they did it with grace. We were beyond a doubt the best pass posting team in the world. But it wasn't without a lot of hard work. Long hours on the casino floor, always on guard for security. I'm constantly practicing in order to keep the edge. Look, I started gambling in grade school, flipping baseball cards with the other kids. I lost my whole pack to a couple of kids who cheated me. I think I knew even then that the only sure thing in gambling is cheating. But at the peak of his success, Richard Marcus is dealt a stunning setback. Florida. A condo in Florida. That sounds nice. What are you ever going to see it? Every day, Richard. That's what I'm trying to tell you. I'm retiring. <laughs> what are you talking about, Joe? You're our fearless leader. <laughs> I'm still fearless. I'm just not your leader anymore. Joel just said, guys, I'm 56 years old. I uh, had a lot of fun with you guys, and that's it. I'm done. I'm not kidding, Richard. I'm ready to get out. From the top of their game to the pits, Joe Klassen's team is in tatters. But Richard didn't give it up. Why? It was in his blood. He didn't know anything else except how to cheat. He was making a very good fortune at it. It's 1993, and Richard Marcus wants to take cheating to the next level. You cannot just find someone and say, look, I have a great uh, casino pass posting operation. I'd like you to sign up. Uh, it didn't work that way. Uh, doing what we do, it takes a, a lot of qualities. It takes intelligence, courage. Maybe it was time to do something else. And then uh, I ran into an old friend in Vegas uh, that I knew from New Jersey. This guy, Andy Abramowitz, was a little skinny, mad gambler that I, I played poker with in high school. He does. He thinks I'm bluffing. Okay, Mr. Smartass, if I'm bluffing, why am I betting two grand on this hand? No, no, never mind two grand. Five grand. Five thousand. One hundred and thirteen dollars. Now, Mr. Tough Guy, now, who's bluffing? You are. <laughs> Three aces. And sure enough, I, I approached him and uh, he said, uh, yeah, yeah, let's go do it. Not that I had any more guts than anybody else, but I just didn't really care that much about, I didn't think about the end result. I just did it and that was, I lived from moment to moment. Hey, you paid me. You, you, I'm, so, I'm sorry. Hey, hey, hey. I'm sorry. Right away, as Marcus begins the training, he can see that Andy's old nickname, Balls, still applies. Eventually, he learned how to tame that, and he harnessed all that uh, excess energy, and he became uh, my partner. But it's not enough. Richard Marcus wants to take past posting where it has never gone before. He wants to be a legend. Now, Balls was uh, a, an okay blackjack mechanic, but I needed somebody that had a tremendous presence. On, somebody that could really, time, really, you? really yeah. sell the casinos as a real high roller, a real personable oh, guy. And I knew right away, as soon as I met Pat, that Pat was the guy. Of course, you ask me, it's easier going than it is come, you know what I mean? 
Jeez. All right, I'm betting with you this time, big guy, all right? Let's both go home winners. Pat Mallory is an old friend of Balls. Like Richard and Balls himself, Pat is a graduate of the streets. A lifelong hustler with one eye out for a new scam. I'm following you this time, big guy. Let's both go home winners, right? Absolutely. All right. What are you laughing at, Napoleon? Jeez, look at this one. Pat is a, a wild, crazy Irishman uh, with dark Irish roots who, uh, who Balls told me would, would just be great for this. Taking my money and laughing the whole time. That's beautiful. Nine to five, take Pat's money. How's that for a freaking job, huh? The fast life, the drinking, the wine, the women, the song. You know, and uh, then the nightlife of Las Vegas and all that. But that whole environment, uh, I had a craving for always. And it just was a natural guy with a great personality. Uh, uh, and, and personality was very important when you play the part, it is very important when you play the part of a claimer. You, you want the casino people to like you. When you're claiming a bet and you're trying to steal money from them, you, they, they're more apt to give the money to somebody they like uh, versus somebody they don't like. But veteran though he is, Pat Mallory has never even seen a past post before. Marcus puts him through several weeks of training in Vegas. Now he wants to see how fast his new racehorse can run. But is Richard Marcus's team really ready for the big time? World-class casino cheat Richard Marcus has put together a new team of past posters. If he's trained them right, the team will be able to rake millions in chips off of Vegas's casino tables. Everything depends on the new recruit, a blarney-kissed Irish raconteur named Pat Mallory. Marcus has groomed Mallory like a young pitcher with a million-dollar arm. Now it's time to put him up against the major league life. He told us he had a ritual. And he was very secretive about his ritual. It was, it was how he would prepare himself to go out and go to work. The key ingredients to this transformation, a little mood music and plenty of booze. Cheers. Here's to you and me. Baby, can't you see? I've seen Sinatra 20 times. I like his music and stuff like that. So he get me in a relaxing mood. We're gonna be rich, not for us. Don't be a brontosaurus. Go to it. We I just called it. I was getting cocked up. We should make a toast. Then get my costume ready, my, my suit, my shoes. But we can be the best. My the rings, the jewelry, and get all set and ready to go. Got whatever it takes. We'll make our own lucky breaks. Cheers. To Pat, alcohol was a lot of fuel. That made him made him much more effective, made him made him almost unstoppable. So clear the decks for action. And most people wearing sunglasses at night in a casino would draw immediate suspicion from the casino. But this guy was so personable and so uh, had such a, a way about him that no one suspected him of anything. He, he was just unbelievable. We're pretty sure Pat's ancestors escaped from an insane asylum somewhere near his hometown in Massachusetts. Before he was 17, he burglarized every house in his hometown at least once. And he held up the same gas station attendant three times with the same fake pistol and Frankenstein mask. I was itching to start actually doing these pass posts with $5,000 chips, which are called chocolates. At the time, I wasn't thinking, oh, I could do this because I really wasn't that good. Mainly because in Caesar's Palace, their $5,000 chips for many years were like a chocolate brown. Nobody had ever tried a casino pass post with a, with a chocolate $5,000 chip. $5,000 chips, well, that's a, that's a set of handcuffs there. The plan is to start slow with small switches. But Pat is just too hot to wait. Pat said, it's over. Give me the chocolate chips, because we already had them ready. And he said, let's go, because the party's starting and the show is on. Switched the bet over. I wasn't that fast at that time. 
But I got it done just enough to where I told him. Adela, you did not pay me correctly. And the guy looked over and he still didn't know what I was talking about. I'm sorry. That was a blackjack with a nice pretty chocolate one there. Thank you. It's all right. With the switch in, Mallory moves his hand to reveal the thousands in backup chips. So he looked and he went right into the rack and he paid me the 5000 Thank you. That one's yours. Thank you, sir. I was so overwhelmed by that. Here it was, a $5,000 move, and the dealer just paid it without telling a soul. And that's, um, you know, led to an evening of, uh, of a rampage. On that first night, Marcus, Mallory, and Abramowitz walk away with more than $100,000 in profits. He took over the casino. It was a beautiful thing. It was beautiful. It was like we were born that night with the 5,000 of the chocolate chips. That was it. Over the next six months, the team will con the casinos out of $800,000. Pat had such a presence. He was like Jackie Gleason. He could entertain. And the pit bosses and the dealers got to a point they enjoyed having him around. He just controlled the situation. Meanwhile, he to him. 151 in a row got paid. He was slipping the browns in their blacks and nobody was even doubting what he was doing. And finally, on the 152nd time, the pit boss had told uh, his dealer to pay Pat, and just as the, the dealer was laying the chips, the, the $5,000 chips in Pat's betting circle, the pit boss's hand went in a circle and snatched up the chips, and he said, hey, wait a minute, I don't want to pay that. Like tennis shorts under my suit with a tennis outfit and uh, I walked out of the bantam in a tennis outfit just with a carry bag and walked right by security water probably just really on the alert looking for a guy in a suit for Richard Marcus there are no more doubts his new team member Pat Mallory is the best Marcus has ever seen but Mallory's $10,000 near miss at Caesars has cost them. Even skipping town won't put an end to their troubles this time. Cheaters' moves, which escaped detection only a few years before, are under greater and greater scrutiny. Richard, he's the reason we got the better technology. He's the reason we got better training. He's the reason that the gaming changed. He changed it. He didn't realize it, but he did. He helped instigate a change. The change begins in November 1989, when Steve Wynn opens the Mirage Hotel and Casino. Wynn's investment sets off a chain reaction of construction projects. New hotels and casinos push the famous strip further out into the desert. Each one competing to be the biggest, the grandest, the most opulent. Gambling becomes big business like never before, and Sin City falls into corporate hands. And one of the top priorities for the new owners blows the cheaters down. By 1994, casino surveillance has been transformed. Thousands of cameras watch the tables 24 hours a day, each one recording what it sees onto videotape. Pure sleight of hand moves, switching bets, capping bets, bending cards, marking cards in play. Those things have gone by the, by the way of the history book because uh, take a look at the way surveillance has progressed. Will Richard Marcus be next? In the surveillance rooms, his is a famous face. Andy Anderson's pursuit has helped turn Marcus into an internationally known crook. I wanted them so bad that I really did go after him. It's a little bit harder than I probably should have, but I did. I made him my personal, mm, I'm going to get you. Just when Richard Marcus has built a world-class cheating crew, they may be forced into retirement. See, a good cheating move only works to a certain extent. Once the casinos and once the valence gets it down, it's harder to get it on each and every time. But Richard has no intention of actually quitting. He wants to be the best. To stay on top, he needs a new move. Something to beat the cameras and to beat Andy Anderson. Something so sleek and silky that it will slide past every dealer, pit boss, and floor walker from Reno to Monte Carlo. But what could this new move be? With surveillance tighter than ever, 
casino cheat Richard Marcus and partner Pat Mallory conjure up the ultimate unbeatable con. We went to a bar where the ladies hang out and uh, I had a couple cocktails. We were just, you know, we were just getting ready to leave Reno and the blackjacks and all that. It was, it was okay, but it was just, it was, it was getting wearing us down. And the exposure, you know, Reno, Las Vegas. I was sitting there thinking and thinking, and I mean, I was determined to come up with something. Hey, Johnny. Yeah, Johnny. I got an idea. Yeah? Well, you know how we bet low and... Then if it wins, we switch it out for a high bet? Well, yeah. What if we reverse the move? What if we bet it so it's a legitimate bet? Johnny, you may have just given me an incredible idea. Okay, right. That night, on the kitchen table, Richard Marcus begins to experiment. Is it possible to design a new move? to make Pat's idea a new reality. The problem is getting the bet right. on the table, right. making sure the high chips cannot be seen until he wants no. them to. <laughs> it all depends on just the right sleight of hand, the invisible flick of the wrist. If Richard can get it right, he might just be able to outsmart every casino camera, every security guard, every time he chooses. <laughs> what Pat has suggested is to turn the move inside out. In Richard and Pat's new move, they bet high. For example, two $1,000 chips, but they have to hide those high-value chips under a small-value chip. It is crucial for the execution of this scam that the dealer not see the big money chips. Why? Because if the bet loses, the cheater is going to rake those big money chips off and replace them with a stack of small money chips. But the true genius of this move comes if the cheater wins. In the event of a win, the cheater simply leaves the chips where they are. If it hit on the number, guess what? It was already there, they'd get paid. If it wasn't hit, they'd reach over, snatch their money, and that would be it. And the beauty of it was, uh, if they called surveillance and expected to see some kind of a move, there wasn't anything to see. The bet was down the entire time. So it was, it was a perfect, almost a perfect scam. Under this new system, every win is legitimate. It's only the losses that are cons. And in casinos, no one pays much attention to losing bets. And even if the cheater is caught yanking the big bet, there's still a way to avoid losing it. Switch the chips as you apologize. We always had a backup. You know, you've been drinking, you're cocked up, and uh, you go through the act, and I'm sorry I didn't see the ball drop. That's why Richard's chip placement is so essential. The dealer mustn't know the big chips are there in case the player has to switch them. But you have to ask yourself, is it really gonna work? Are the casinos really gonna be conquered by this tiny little shadow? In October 1995, Richard and Pat road test the move in Reno. I wanted to see if I could bet a $100 chip underneath a roulette chip or roulette chips and slant the roulette chips outward toward the dealer so that the bottom $100 chip would be concealed. I just wanted to see if that would work. Will that eighth of an inch fool the dealer? Could that tiny shadow be a sign of a vast illicit fortune waiting to be won? And sure enough, the bet won. And here's the, what made it really unbelievable. When it won, the dealer paid $3, which meant she never saw the $100 chip. Pat and I were just staring at each other when, after she paid us, we just looked at each other and we both realized that right at that moment we were into something new. Am I 
about you? Would you like one? No, Savannah, not tonight. Thanks. Johnny. Johnny. A hundred bucks for a tip? Johnny, my lad. I have a feeling there will be enough money for plenty of Savannahs to come. And from that, we decided to call the move the Savannah move because that's when we both realized that we would probably be making a lot of money from this move. But Richard Marcus still hasn't tried to collect on a Savannah move. Does she have real legs? Can she really escape the ever-present cameras? Can she elude the vigilant eye of Andy Anderson? Richard Marcus is about to test out his new knockout under the toughest possible conditions. Las Vegas, Nevada. Casino cheat Richard Marcus and his partner Pat Mallory are giving their new cheating move, the Savannah, the ultimate road test. Savannah is Marcus's old pass posting move. Sir, can't do that with a chip. Turned inside out. I don't even know what I was thinking. In fact, you know what, here, take this too. Well, thank you. A little too much of the juice, you know what I mean? It's creating a, a tableau or an, an image or replacing. The idea is to replace everything the dealer had in his or her head before I did the move with what I want them to see now. The cheetah bets a valuable stack of chips, or as casino pros call them, checks. I walk up and I just cut those chips right like that in a certain way, which prevents you from seeing that there's a white chip underneath. So you assume it's $10. If he wins, the cheetah simply leaves the chips where they are. But if he loses, he pinches or rakes the big chips off the layout. Sometimes the dealer doesn't even see that I picked them up, and I don't have to do anything. But if she says, hey, 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 put those chips back down, I just go ahead and I put down the $10 back on each bet. And meanwhile, the $5,000 chips are securely in my hand, and they're gone. That is the greatest chip casino cheating move ever of all time, and it will never be beat. The reason technology helped a, a, a scam like Richard Marcus's is because you would not be asked to review a $15 move if you thought somebody picked up a bet and then, oh, well, he's drunk, he makes a mistake, he puts it back. Sir, you can't do that with them chips. Uh, you know what? I don't even know what I was thinking. I'm sorry. Here, you take those. In fact, here, take this too. Merry Christmas. I'm done. But can Savannah earn the kind of money Richard Marcus has his eye on? He has proven he can pass post in casinos with the $5,000 chips known as chocolates. Can Savannah do the same? He'll look for the answer on the roulette layout. A roulette wheel can have up to 38 numbers. Gamblers can choose a wide range of bets, paying up to 35 to 1. Pat Mallory is the caller. He stands close to the roulette wheel and reacts out loud, as close as possible to the spin, as if he were a better himself. Jeez. The caller's reaction is actually a signal, giving the raker the most possible time to switch in the low bet. I had some bad luck. Uh, four or five times in a row, I picked up. Finally, the ball hits the number bet. Yes, yes, Now, yes. no need for a switch. It's five Gs right there, Brian. What do you five mean? Five Gs. Those are nickels. See for yourself. Five Gs, Brian. When I walked out of that casino, jiggling those chocolate chips in my hand, I was in such a, a state of euphoria. I was feeling so unbelievably high. Uh, I'm saying to myself, wow, this is a whole new age, a uh, whole new era of casino cheating coming because I thought I was uh, on the road to retirement. He assaulted, assaulted uh, the town with this move. Savannah takes Vegas completely by surprise. Throughout the fall of 1995, Pat Mallory and Richard Marcus collect win after win. After they bring Balls Abramowitz in on the new trick, 
There are three cheetahs working a never-before-seen move up and down the strip, taking five or ten thousand dollars off the tables, five nights a week. Even Marcus's most dedicated nemesis, casino detective Andy Anderson, is baffled. I'd love to say, oh, I spotted that right away. No, that's not true. No, no, no. All I remember, once I saw the move, I almost had a heart attack. Andy Anderson, as smart as he is and as, and as, and as efficient as he is at what he does, he could, not, he could not stoop to a level of thinking so stupidly that the, the kind of stupid thinking that would be required for him to figure out what we were doing. I was looking for one way of cheating, and they completely had flipped the tables on us. The team enjoys an uninterrupted run of four months with Savannah in Las Vegas. The low estimate of their take in Savannah's first season? Two million dollars. But by December 1995, Marcus can see that Las Vegas is getting to know his favorite new lady, when a perfectly ordinary Savannah turns into a test of wills. What's the problem? He's got chocolate under his red and I didn't see it. The pit boss instructs the dealers to close the table and pay off the other players. Pay them off, shut it down. I just knew that now, of course, they're going to go to the tape and zoom down at the table. Richard Marcus. Pull that tape back. There's no way that's a legitimate bet. You know, I'm sweating too, but I'm not showing it. And finally, I, I realize, you know, a half hour goes by, an hour goes by, and I'm, I, I'm hoping they have the damn thing on tape. Because, you know, if they have it on tape, they see it's a legitimate bet, they gotta pay you. One hour stretches into two hours, two hours into three. Then... Uh -huh. Okay, pay them. Sorry about that delay, sir. If you come with me, we'll cash out your checks for you. Thank you. Thank you very much. This type of cheating hasn't been, wasn't seen, wasn't known before. It was too simple to understand. And it's just hard to believe that they can't see it, but you can't see it. Basically, we never did come up with a, quote, way to stop it. It's just that we hoped we refused to pay it, a lot of them. Refusal to pay. The last-ditch effort by casinos to flush out cheaters. It's risky, because a legitimate gambler will likely call the gaming control board and get the casino in hot water. Cheaters, however, argue at the table. They will never call the authorities, because they don't want the attention. Anytime I feel a twinge of guilt, I remind myself that the casinos are the biggest thieves around. Well, maybe the second biggest. For five more years, Richard Balls and Pat worked the Savannah move in the United States and overseas. They earned between five and seven million dollars. By 2000, Richard Marcus has finally saved enough money never to have to work or cheat again. When I look at that now, I regret, I regret some of it, you know, okay, uh, I did not have a normal life, uh, uh, I missed out on certain things. I don't think Richard's retired, he likes to tell people, I'm hanging it up, and I made enough money. If I had the chance to do it over, I'd do one thing differently, just try and make more money than I did. Yes! 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 I just loved it, uh, it, it was a love more than an addiction. Here I am, 60 some years old plus, and I still got that tingle. And I'd still go out and bust Richard Marcus tomorrow.